Yeah, so fast forward from my getting excited about medical genetics as a medical student, then I go through four years of medicine uh, training and then three years as a resident. And then it's finally time to learn the research part of this. Recognizing I have a PhD, so people assume I know what I'm doing, but my PhD in quantum mechanics is not particularly helpful when I'm suddenly plunged into a lab and given a project uh, that I'm supposed to pursue, surrounded by other incredibly experienced, highly productive postdoctoral fellows. And here's this guy, Collins, who isn't quite sure how to turn on the autoclave. So it was a rough start. And I had a mentor who was both the smartest guy I've ever known and one of the worst communicators. So a lot of the time, I really wasn't quite sure what he was suggesting that I should do. Finally got started on a project, which did seem really exciting. Uh, that if This was a new way of studying DNA in large pieces, which at the time was pretty hard to do. And if it worked, everybody was going to want to use this vector that I was working on. So I was like imagining uh, the way in which this would play out. I uh, would get a paper in a prominent journal. People would be writing to me saying, oh, teach me how to do this. There were some fits and starts, again, because I didn't know what I was doing. But ultimately, I got to the point where there was the definitive experiment. And I had my high hopes on this. The experiment, this was like six, nine months after I started. The experiment took a whole week. And then the day came to reveal the results. And it was a complete and utter disaster. Uh, it was unsalvageable. The whole premise of the experiment turned out to be flawed. And I... In retrospect, probably should have done more homework and maybe would have realized that, but I was, you know, in this optimistic, hopeful, oh yeah, it'll work, and it didn't. I was utterly devastated. It was a failure of experiment, but it felt like a failure of me. Uh, and I, it was hard to admit that to the other people around me. I admit in the book, I spent some time in the men's room sitting in the stall crying because I was so destroyed by this. And I went the next day uh, to tell my mentor that I had failed and that I was strongly considering leaving. And I said the same to my department chair. And interestingly, both of them sort of laughed it off and said, oh, you'll learn from this. <laughs> this happened to me too. <laughs> they all had their stories of failure. And I realized that actually is a pretty significant and important part of science, <laughs> the failure part both because it reminds you that science isn't going to give you the answer you want just because you want it. you got to really expect uh, that nature's secrets uh, are there to be discovered, but they're not going to just suddenly turn out the way you want them to. You've got to do every kind of rigorous design of your own approach, and I hadn't necessarily done that. But that's what I learned from it. My department chair told me his spectacular failure and said, it was that that made him the successful scientist that he was uh, the next time around. So I was like, oh boy, okay, I guess I don't want to be a failure. Um, I even looked at my, my Christian background, because by then I was a serious Christian, and looked at all the people in, in the Old and New Testament who had failed and how they rose up from that, not necessarily to be wild successes, but to learn from that. Okay, that's something I should try to do too. No, I'd have gone off and done something else because I was really close to that. Uh, I just felt like I'm not cut out for this. Look what just happened. It's hard, you know, when you're starting out, your projects become so intensely part of who you are. Here, I'm talking to you right now in my lab at NIH. I have a bunch of uh, junior researchers through the wall, and they are in that same mindset. Uh, and I uh, just talked to one of them today who had a project that has failed and just seems so despondent about it. And so I had to tell him my story. <laughs> so that, and this is, you know, pass on the experience uh, that he would recognize. He's going to learn from this too. It's going to be okay. I wasn't going to make the same mistake of just assuming that hopefulness is going to lead to success. If you're going to do a scientific experiment, you better think of all the ways that your hypothesis might be wrong <laughs> and your experiments might be flawed <laughs> before you just plunge in and say, okay, it'll probably work. Uh, that is not going <laughs> to serve you well. I already learned that. So it was a totally different project. Uh, this was one focused on sickle cell disease. So it was getting me closer to a medical application, and I liked that too. 
But I had to do a lot of deep looking at the background information, uh, what materials I would have available. There were some family DNA samples uh, that nobody had looked at that sounded like they might be interesting, needed to be sure those samples were still intact. <laughs> they were something I could work with and then come up with a hypothesis that if I was right, it made a pretty big difference in our understanding of how these genes for hemoglobin were regulated. If I was wrong, I would still learn something that would be useful to somebody. Well, part of it is courage in taking on a really hard project and being willing to accept the fact that you may fail and that will not add to, uh, to your stature. Uh, part of it is uh, taking the kind of strategy that science is not just an academic exercise, uh, it's actually an effort to try to help somebody. And that may mean uh, taking yourself out of your comfort zone, if you're a basic scientist, and trying to figure out how do you actually translate that into some clinical action. And certainly when COVID came along, uh, a time where I had a lot of responsibility as the NIH director, uh, it took the courage of pulling teams together of people who maybe didn't really see that that was going to be the right answer and weren't that comfortable with each other and, and trying to make the case uh, that with people dying all around us, we had to do everything possible uh, with bold ideas uh, that might fail uh, for therapeutics, for vaccines, for diagnostics, for all of that. Um, and then also to have the courage uh, to speak to the public about what you know and admit what you don't know, because uh, that doesn't always come quite as easily. <laughs> Uh, we are all kind of like uh, impressed at some level with our own special expertise. And it's harder to say, you know, I don't know the answer to that one, but we should get really good at it. Well, I didn't expect it, that's for sure. The Genome Project had just gotten started in 1990. I was a big fan of it. Uh, Jim Watson, as in Watson and Crick, was the first leader. But he got into a bit of a tussle uh, with his boss, the head of the NIH, uh, because Watson was famous for pretty much saying whatever came to mind, and sometimes it was pretty insulting. And before long, he was gone. And the Genome Project was just a baby in the crib, and we were all pretty worried, this is maybe not gonna go well without a leader, and then my phone rings, and they're saying, we want you to apply. And I said, no, <laughs> I, that's not me. <laughs> I'm here at the University of Michigan. I'm running a research lab that's going pretty well. I'm teaching medical students, which I enjoy. I'm taking care of patients. This is what I'm supposed to do. Find somebody else. Well, they kept calling. And I kept saying no. And eventually, I find myself in the office of the NIH director who's given me the hard sell. And I'm prepared to say no again. And then the strangest thing happened. <laughs> Uh, she gets through a big paragraph about what this is the greatest job in the world, leading the Human Genome Project. This is historic. And I'm like uh, fully defended. And she stops in the middle of a sentence and she says, you know, Francis, I don't think I'm getting through to you. <laughs> and I thought, okay, she's picked up on that. She said, I'm just having this image right now that it's quite some time from now and I'm in an assisted living home and I'm coming down the hallway with my walker. And I look up ahead and I see you, Francis, and you're coming towards me with your walker, huh? And you come up next to me and you look at me and you say, damn it, I should have taken that job. And it was the dumbest thing anybody ever said to me in a job interview. And it completely destroyed me because she got exactly what was nagging at me with all of these refusals to consider this. I might really be passing up the most amazing job in life science in the whole century because it wasn't a convenient time and it wasn't the kind of idea that I'd had about myself and it meant I'd have to be a federal employee and that didn't sound good. All those things were scaring me off, but what would I say 30 or 40 years later if I realized I passed up what might have been the most phenomenal scientific experience anybody could have.